Well, it's an honor to introduce my friend Miko. And uh, I show my age because I was on a UN NGO committee with his father in the mid 80s, <laughs> working on justice in Palestine. And I had such great respect for uh, Mati Pellet, this great general who, tur who turned toward peace and justice in Palestine. And those seeds were planted in that household with his mom too. And now we get to reap the benefits of the general son, that book, who is a force for truth on this issue. And he's crisscrossing the world. He's just recently been speaking all over South Africa on the uh, apartheid, anti-Israel apartheid movement. And uh, he was in Czechoslovakia recently, all over the globe, and is feeling the solidarity of the movement. And now we have to bring that force here, and no better person to do it for us than Miko Pellet. Let's walk. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Seville, for inviting me. Thank you all for being here. Um, the question of hope is one that comes up a lot on this issue. And as you, you can all see, there are hundreds of people here and thousands across the world who are deeply engaged with this issue where you could argue they have actually no reason to care about this issue whatsoever. And if that doesn't give hope, I don't know what does. On top of that, we've got great inspiration, wonderful leadership from people like uh, Abuna Neymatik. I don't know if you heard his, um, his uh, talk last night, but I was up half the night thinking about it. I don't know that you hear many clergy who would say, thank God for BDS, who would have the courage to say that. And he talked about, yeah. And he talked about courage and the need to have courage. And um, I need to thank him for his courage and his, his, and his inspiration because, of course, he's leading all of us here. And like I said, many others around the world. Um, the issue of Palestine is obviously one that is covered up in layers of myth. And um, sometimes it's hard to sift through and get to the point. So I'm going to try to get to the point as quickly as possible. But I think there are two issues that have to be brought up, especially when we're in a Christian context. And that is the issue that somehow criticizing Israel is anti-Semitic. That somehow Israel is the answer to the Holocaust. And I think it's important to, dis to dispel these two myths as quickly as possible. There's nothing anti-Semitic about criticizing Israel, first of all, because there's nothing Jewish about Israel. There's nothing inherently Jewish about Zionism, there never was. The Zionists secularized Judaism and turned, decided that Jews are a nation. They secularized the Bible and turned it into a history book. They did this on their own. They represent no one. The fact is most Jews do not live in Israel, did not heed to the call of Zionism. And most of the people who do, li do live in Israel or under Israeli rule are not Jews. There's nothing inherently Jewish about holding thousands of political prisoners. There's nothing inherently Jewish about racist laws. There's nothing inherently Jewish about denying children water because they are non-Jews. So there's nothing Jewish about Israel and there's nothing anti-Semitic about criticizing and rejecting Israel, not to mention look around the room and look at the speakers and see how many Jewish people are talking to you about this issue and rejecting Zionism. So I think it's important to talk about this. The other issue is this, uh, is this uh, Holocaust issue. Um, that Israel is the response to the Holocaust, that Israel is, the, is our defense as Jews, so there will not be another Holocaust. It's our guarantee. Well, let's take a look what happened after the Holocaust, after World War II. Out of two million Jewish refugees who were in internment camps in, uh, in Europe, all over Europe after World War II, how many went to Israel? Less than 10%, somewhere between 150 and 200,000. Out of two million, the vast majority of the very Jews who you would have thought would heed the call of Zionism said, no, we want to regain our identity as Europeans, as Belgians, as French, or come to America. The answer 
to racism, whether it's anti-Semitism or any other kind of racism, is not more racism somewhere else. It's the end of racism everywhere. And many of the Holocaust survivors who did immigrate to Israel left, either because they were disgusted by the racism they saw there, or because they were treated very poorly by the Zionists, or for other reasons. So I think these are two myths that are it's very, very important to dispel, particularly when we talk in a, in a non-Jewish, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Christian um, setting. Now, we heard a lot about the peace talks. And there's a lot of disappointment. Every time the peace talks fail, there's disappointment. And I think the reason there's disappointment is, of course, because we want peace, we want to see peace. But I think it's important to understand that the peace talks are failing because the peace talks are not meant to solve any problem. In fact, they are not even close to, they're not even going in a direction that can solve the problem in Palestine. And there's this illusion that there's an Israel and a Palestine, that we have two countries. These countries are at war, these people don't get along, and therefore we need an American broker to bring the sides together and make peace, and darn it, they just keep failing. These people just don't get along. But is this the reality? Are there two countries, two armies, that are at war here? That's not the reality. Israel and Palestine, it's interesting, I just had this conversation outside with somebody. Israel and Palestine are two names for the same country. Israel and Palestine is the exact same place. It is one country. Governed by one government. It is one state, one army, two nations. But the problem here is not two countries at war, the problem, and, the, the, the can re, and, and, the, and therefore it cannot be resolved by peace talks, the problem here is a, pro, is a problem of oppression and colonialism and racism. And the way to end that is through a concerted effort, an anti-apartheid effort, an anti-racism effort, which I would say, I would, I would call anti-Zionist effort. Because Zionism replaced apartheid. And this is exactly why it's failing. It's failing because it's not supposed to succeed, because it's going in the wrong direction altogether. You cannot solve this problem without recognizing that the issue is the issue of oppression, of colonialism, and of racism. And the way to move ahead is to dismantle, and somebody I heard the previous panel had this question, to dismantle the Zionist state in favor of a real democracy, just like was done in South Africa, where you had to dismantle apartheid in order to relieve the plight of, of black South Africans. This is the direction to go, and this is the only way we're going to see any change. And like I said earlier, through, through this very inspirational leadership of people like Naim Atik and other Palestinians, people who lead the BDS movement, people who lead the, uh, the, the popular resistance, and others, young students on campuses, many are Palestinians, many are not, super here in town at the local university, these are, these are the people, these are the movements, this is the direction it has to go. And I think this was said earlier today, and I'll say this again. Every generation, I think, is judged by a certain issue. I think the 60s, it was the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement here in America. The 80s, it was apartheid in South Africa. We are all going to be judged. We are all going to have to answer to this issue on Palestine. Now, this is the defining issue of our time. And all of us here, and everyone who stood for Palestine and stood for justice, will be able to tell our kids and our grandkids exactly where we stood, because they will ask, and they should ask. And the people who stood on the other side, and the people who waved the Israeli flag when bombs were falling on Gaza, and the people who support and excuse the crimes of Israel, will either hide in a corner somewhere or deny that they ever supported Israel. Just like today, you're not going to find anyone who supported apartheid in South Africa. Everybody loved Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Suddenly. This is exactly the process we're going to see, and I, I, I would bet that this is going to be much sooner than most people think. I think in 10 years, these people are all going to be sitting in a corner ashamed, or if they have any integrity, they will apologize for supporting Israel and for the crimes of Israel against the Palestinians. Now, often we, you know, people talk about what happened, how did it all start, and you know, generally it all started when white people in Europe thought they had the right to take somebody else's, one person's country and give it to somebody else. 
So Zionists always talk about the Balfour Declaration as though it is the 11th commandment, as though it came down from, <laughs> from the mountain with Moses, the Balfour Declaration. So Lord Balfour uh, made a promise to his friend, Lord Rothschild, that Palestine will be given to the Jews as a homeland. Who is he to give anything to anybody anyway? But this is how it was. White people felt that they had the right to take brown people's land and give it to whoever they wanted. And that's exactly what happened. But in the end, I think, the, fine, the way I see it, the final, uh, or, or maybe the beginning of, of the conflict, the way we need to talk about it, is, is, is when the United Nations decided, or somehow thought that it had the right to partition Palestine and give a portion of it to the Jewish population, the Jewish, uh, to the Jews, so to speak. So the Jews wanted a little bit, the Arabs wanted a little bit, we divided and we gave these guys a little bit, that guy's a little bit. And we'll solve the problem. Of course, this is the partition map. The partition of the 29th of November, 1947. There's a street in Jerusalem named after that, after that day. The problem is they decided to give the larger portion of the, of the country to the smaller Jewish community. And they expected that the far larger Palestinian native community would accept this, would accept the smaller portion of the land. In 1947, there were about half a million Jews in Palestine. These were my grandparents who immigrated there, their generation, and my parents who were born there. The, pap the Palestinian population numbered about 15, uh, 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 a million and a half people. So you had half, a small community, half a million Jews, the native community of over or close to a million and a half people. And, this, and they were supposed to accept this. And even today, people so you know, the problem is that the Arabs rejected the partition plan. <laughs> That's why the, co the conflict has been going on for so long. It's an absurd idea, it's an absurd proposition. Another reason this particular day is important is because from that day we have two opposing histories, we have two opposing narratives that began on that day. What happened the day after? And the narrative I grew up with as an Israeli, and I'm sure m most Americans learn, is that after the Arabs rejected this plan, they began a massive assault in order to kill and destroy the small Jewish community in Palestine. And thankfully, the, these young Jews who were there to fight, these descendants of King David who defeated Goliath, and these descendants of the Maccabees who defeated great empires, once again, they defeated the Arabs. And once again, a Jewish state was established in the land of Israel after 2,000 years. This is like a whole new chapter from the, uh, from the Bible. This is so romantic and so heroic. I mean, how could you even begin to refute a narrative like that. Problem is, once again, we look at the details and then what we find is that the Palestinian narrative seems to make a little more sense. Because in 1947-48, the, the two communities were hoping to be, be established as states. But there was one thing that the Jewish, the Zionist community in Palestine had invested in heavily, the Palestinians never did. And that is the thing that made all the difference. It was an armed militia. The Zionist militia, in which my father was an officer, by 1947 numbered close to 40,000 armed, well-trained, highly motivated men. There was no equivalent on the Palestinian side. So who are these Arabs that attacked? If there was no Palestinian militia, who are these Arabs that attacked? We know other Arab armies intervened later on, six, seven, eight months later, intervened in Palestine, and even they were defeated very easily by the Zionist militia. But who are these Arabs that attacked? And what Israeli historians like Ilan Pape and others have been validating now is the Palestinian story that the Arabs didn't attack. As soon as the United Nations accepted this idea of a Jewish state in Palestine, the Zionist militia began a massive assault, a massive campaign that can only be categorized as terrorism and ethnic cleansing. A terrorist attack that lasted a year against a civilian unarmed population in an attempt to complete the ethnic cleansing of Palestine and establish a Jewish state. Within 12 months, they managed to conquer almost the entire country, almost 80% of the country. They managed to destroy hundreds and hundreds of cities and towns and villages and force into exile somewhere between 800,000 and a million people. Not such a romantic story, but the pieces somehow fit the puzzle now. And another claim that we hear quite often is that, well, maybe a few Arabs were kicked out, maybe a few villages were destroyed, but really there was nothing there. Anything that was there of any value, of any progress, was brought by the Jews, by the Zionists. 
So I'd like to show this picture of the city of Jaffa before 1948. The city of Jaffa sits on the Mediterranean, or sat on the Mediterranean coast. A major Arab city, close to 120,000 people. A rich political life, rich uh, business life, trade unions and teachers guilds and writers guilds. Several newspapers were printed in Jaffa. They had movie theaters and concert halls. All the greatest names in the Arab world would come to perform in Jaffa. And in a matter of two weeks in 1948, the city of close to 120,000 was reduced to less than 4,000 people. Concentrated in one neighborhood with barbed wires and Israeli guards surrounding them. And today, on that spot, almost from the exact same angle, sits the city of Tel Aviv, an Israeli city. The city of Tel Aviv calls itself Tel Aviv Yaffa because they kept a small part of Yaffa still, and there is still a small Palestinian population in Yaffa. Neglected, deprived, oppressed, and subject to racist laws and harassment from the Israeli military. Now why is this important? Not only to know what happened. This is also important in the context of where we go forward. To try to reduce Palestine to the West Bank and Gaza is a huge mistake. Because Palestine is the entire country. The suffering Palestinians take place in the, in the entire country. The Palestinians who live in Jaffa, like many Palestinians in other parts of, of, of Israel, what is called Israel, are subject to racist laws. They're all Israeli citizens. Israeli police does not go in to solve crime in places like Jaffa. So, of course, crime thrives. Murder cases go on for decades unresolved, unsolved. The only form of law enforcement that enters Palestinian communities inside Israel are the Mishmar Gvul, the border police, whose whole aim is to terrorize and to harass Palestinians. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard the term Nakba, the catastrophe. And I remember when I heard the term Nakba the first time, I was actually offended because the Nakba means the catastrophe, it refers to what happened in 1948. And I was thinking, how can anybody refer to the war of 1948, the war that we call the War of Independence, as a catastrophe? Maybe a few Arabs suffered, but basically this was an important event. The revival of the Jewish people and so on. Well, over the years, through my journey to Palestine, I talk about this in the book as well, I learned why it's called the Nakba. But I think what people fail to realize is that the Palestinian Nakba did not begin in 1948. I mean, did not happen in 1948. It began in 1948. It continues to this day. I took this picture in a refugee camp about a year ago. As you can see, there's no sewage. I can tell you there's no running water. There's no electricity. There's no access to health care. There's no access to proper nutrition. Now, this is not in some remote uh, mountaintop in Afghanistan. This is sometimes, this could be half an hour drive, 20 minute drive, maybe an hour's drive for major modern cities inside Israel into which these children are not permitted to enter. They're the very places from where their grandparents were, forced, were, were kicked out. There is no reason for these children to live like this. You're not going to see Israeli children live like this, look like this. The Palestinian Akba continues, this catastrophe continues, it gets worse and worse by the day. It is funded by the ongoing Nakba, the continuation of the Nakba is funded by our tax dollars. It is shameful, it is inexcusable, it is unjustifiable, and it's happening every day under our watch. Which is why it's time for action. Which is why it's time for action. Now, there's a story, I'm sure some of you may have heard me tell the story, but if you haven't, it's in the book as well. And it's a story that has to do with my mother. My book is a memoir, so my entire family was very much involved with the creation and the establishment of the State of Israel. My mother's father signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence. He was a, an important Zionist leader. My father was a general and so on. And there's a story that my mother told me many, many times as I was growing up about something that she experienced in 1948. Now, she was born and raised in Jerusalem. By the way, how many people here have been to Palestine? Israel? Oh, okay. All right. I risk my case. Um, <laughs> And so she was born and raised in Jerusalem, not the old city of Jerusalem, but the neighborhoods that were built outside of the old city, in the modern side of Jerusalem, which later became the Israeli side. Um, so she was born and raised there. She knew the city well. She knew the people well. And of course, there were um, some significant and, and well-to-do Palestinian neighborhoods and Palestinian communities living in Jerusalem on the western side. 
uh, outside of the old city. In 1948, my mother was a young mother already. She was 22, that's that picture. By the way, she's 87. She still lives in Jerusalem and she's doing very well. Um, in 1948, the Zionist forces came in, took the Palestinian neighborhoods, forced the people out, and made these beautiful homes available to Israeli families. And if you've been there and you've seen these, the neighborhoods are there, the homes are still there, they're very distinct Palestinian Jerusalemite homes. Well, my mother refused. And the way she told me the story many, many times, and she still does when we talk about this, is with such emotion, she'll say, how could I possibly have taken the home of another mother? How could I move into the home of another family that now has to live in exile? Now, besides being a very good story, and besides hoping that more people would have done what she did, of course, most people didn't, there was something about the story that was very troubling to me growing up. And I was only able to really understand why it was troubling when I was working on the book several years ago. She was presenting a moral dilemma in a narrative that has no moral dilemmas, that is morally perfect. Her story was contradicting the national narrative. The Zionist narrative is morally perfect. The land belongs to us because we are the Jews and we are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews. Though there's little historical evidence to that, but that's what, we, that's what the Zionists claim. Very little historic evidence, but that's what the Zionists claim. So it's our land, we deserve it all. We, because we are gracious and generous and moderate and compromising, agreed to the partition plan which gave us only most of the country, but not all of it. They attacked us, we won, and then we asked them to stay, and they left. We asked them to stay, we asked the Arabs to stay, and they left. So where's the moral dilemma? They left, a home is available, a family needs a home, my mother was living with her, with her parents, with two small children, where's the moral dilemma? Why was she presenting a moral dilemma? The Zionist narrative is so perfect that even when they do talk about atrocities, I'm sure many of you have heard of the massacre of Dir Yassin, which is one of several. Dir Yassin was a small village on the outskirts of was an important Zionist leader, later Zionist on the president Port of the state of Israel, said, thank you. He said that while the massacre was a terrible thing, thankfully as a result of the massacre, thousands of Arabs fled, and that allowed us to create a Jewish majority. And we all know, boys and girls, there is nothing more important than a Jewish majority in the land of Israel. So even this atrocity, come, we come out on top morally. We bomb Gaza and we kill children today, but it's okay because Hamas is in Gaza and they're terrorists. The Zionist narrative is always morally perfect. So this is what the map looked like for the first 20 years between 1948 and 1967. By the way, this map still exists, but only in the minds of, of a few people. In reality, this map no longer exists. Um, and then 1967 rolled around. We're not going to get into all the history, but basically what the Israeli military did is this. They crossed, they took the rest of Palestine, the West Bank and Gaza, the two areas that Israel had not occupied yet, crossed Palestine off the map completely and established a single state over the entire country. Now, two interesting things happened when that took place. My father was a general, He's, he was a member of the Israeli High Command uh, at that time. After the war, he stood up and he said, well, we now have an opportunity to solve the Palestinian problem. We conquered all this land, we're strong, we're undefeatable, but we still have another nation here. We can try to make, we need to make peace with this nation, we need to respect them and allow them to establish a state in the West Bank and Gaza. In fact, he brought intelligence reports that prove that the local leadership were willing to do this and were interested. He said, if we don't do this now, we will become an occupation force, there will be resistance, our army will have to be used to fight the resistance, it will have terrible implications and terrible effects on the moral fiber of the state of Israel and the moral fiber of the Israeli army, and eventually we will become a binational state. Every single thing he said came true. And as he was saying these words, the Israeli bulldozers were already destroying Palestinian cities and towns and villages. Israeli soldiers were forcing hundreds of thousands of Palestinians to leave the West Bank. And a massive building project began immediately in the West Bank, just like Israel had done in other parts of Palestine 20 years earlier. There is no difference between the West Bank and the rest of Israel. So today, and again, once again, why is this important? Because in today's context, 
peace talks and all of this, this discussion about the two-state solution. Israel didn't build, didn't take the West Bank by mistake. It didn't build settlements by mistake. The Israeli army, one of the Israeli army's first orders as they took the West Bank was that the water in the West Bank belongs to the state of Israel. The West Bank has one of the largest water sources in the country. There is no more West Bank. There is no more possibility. There never was a possibility for a two-state solution because Israel doesn't want it. To imagine that there would be an Israeli government that would allow the Palestinians to establish a state between the river and the sea is a complete misunderstanding of what Zionism is, of what Israel is. And the peace talks and 67 years of the, of the existence of the state of Israel proves that. Nothing was done by mistake. And they say this. Israeli commanders, Israeli politicians, Israeli prime ministers have said it for years. There's no difference between the cities in the West Bank and other cities. This is Israel, this is Israel. This is Jewish land, this is Jewish land. Palestinians, well, it's not our problem. I think this is important to get into all of our hearts and minds. There is no scenario in which an Israel, the state of Israel will allow the creation of a Palestinian state or recognize Palestinian rights. Just like the apartheid in South Africa, apartheid regime who could not recognize uh, black, uh, rights of, of blacks and colored people in South Africa. It's an impossibility, which is why we need to reframe uh, the struggle, I believe. Uh, I'm going to skip a couple of pictures here. And then we hear, we hear all the time that Israel wants peace. In fact, this came up now. Once again, the peace talks are falling apart, but Israel wants peace. Don't be misled. Israel really wants peace. Well, let's examine this, okay? So, as my father said after the war, Israel had an opportunity to establish a Palestinian state. Of course, they went on to, to, to completely build settlements and so forth and, and, and integrate the West Bank. In the mid-1970s, my father and other uh, Israelis um, put together or uh, formed an organization that was dedicated to this cause, the recognition of Palestinian